So please. Oh, thank you. I got it here. Thank you. Well, first of all, good morning, everybody. Thank you for staying for the last day. So I'm able to share with you our uh, data. And I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to come to Rio for this wonderful meeting. I learned a lot in photodynamic therapy. It's a very new field for me. And, uh, and uh, I, what I'd like to do now is to tell you some of our work, uh, from combinatorial chemistry to, whoop, the pointer is not working. Maybe need some battery, okay. So, uh, this one doesn't fall work, huh? Is it? Okay. Okay. Uh, All right. We have a new battery. I can't help you here okay. because they fix it. Uh, okay. Next slide, please. So, as a medical oncologist, uh, this is how I see cancer being treated nowadays. We have very potent chemotherapy. They are non specific. For example, plecotaxel, dosorubicin, mitocentron, vinquistin, bleomycin, ethylomycin D. All those are very toxic drugs. They are effective in killing cancer, but yet also affect the whole body tremendously with a lot of side effects. You often shrink the cancer down, but not uncommonly, the cancer come back. So that's the main problem of cancer therapy nowadays. Next slide. What we like to do is to be able to concentrate this highly toxic drug to the tumor site, therefore spare the side effects that exert onto the patient, shrink down the tumor, maybe even cure some patients. Next slide, please. And then in the last 10 years, there's this so-called, so these orange drugs here. They are target-specific drugs. They're tyrosine kinase inhibitor, proteasome inhibitor, and so on and so forth. These drugs, uh, yeah. Yeah, good. Uh, tend to be less toxic, but not always true. You go through the whole body, shrink down the tumor, but uniformly the cancer always come back. The more the specific the drug, the more chance for the cancer to mutate and overcome the drug. Therefore, the cancer always come back. Even though sometimes you got dramatic response uh, for those treatments, and however, the duration of response is often very short, maybe a few months. If we go to a year, this is really tremendous. Often, a few months, then the cancer come back. So what we like to do is really combine the both of these Treatment, using the toxic drug go to the tumor, less toxic drug goes through the whole body, shrink down the tumor, maybe even cure some patient, but probably not. What we need to do at that time is to treat the patient with immunotherapy to harness the immune system of the patient so that we can eventually cure many patients. So this is what we like to do. In my laboratory, we do all these three approaches. So Today's presentation are two parts. First part, I'll talk about combinatorial chemistry, which I've done that for over 20 years now. And specifically, I'll tell you a little bit about OPOC, a method that I invented 20 years ago, and then how to use it to look for cancer targeting ligands, delivery, how to deliver the, the drug. The second part of the talk is nanotechnology. So I'll tell you something what, what uh, we developed about 10 years ago. It's called nanomycel that we uh, encapsulated drug, the toxic drug, highly toxic drug, and able to deliver the tumor site. The more recently, we did some work on lenopoffin, which now to be a, a very useful phototheranostic agent, which is a very good and highly effective photosensitizer, which I'll share with you in a moment. So this is a method I invented a long time ago. It's called one bead, one compound, combinatorial library method. Anybody heard about that method? Raise your hand. Okay. Yeah, so, so I, I invented this 20, over 20 years ago when I was very young. And basically, it's a very simple method. I'll quickly walk through with you. There are millions of beads in here. Those are polystyrene beads, about 100 micron in diameter. And they have amino groups on the bead. You split the beads into three containers. You put A, G, and V. Those are building blocks, for example, amino acid. Then you couple that chemically onto the bead, A, G, and V. Then you mix all the beads together, split them again, A, G, and V. Now you've got a dipeptide. Then you mix all the beads together, split it again. You put A, G, and V, now you've got a tripeptide. The important thing about this method is that each bead sees only one thing at a time, and the reaction is driven to completion. Therefore, each bead has its own molecule. For example, this bead has AAA, but nothing else. This bead has G, V, V, but nothing else. But there are 10 to the 13 copies of the same compound on one bead. Therefore, we call one bead, one compound. So you can see that if there's only three by three by three, it's 27. But if you have 20 containers, 
you go through five steps, will be 20 to the power of five, which is 3.2 million. When you go to seven steps, it's 1.28 billion per mutation. We actually can do that. This, be, this container contains 11 million beads, so there are 11 million different compounds on there. Each bead is different, and we can, the bead can, uh, there are chemical molecules on the bead that we can screen it for many different things, uh, protein targets and so on, but now I talk about cell. We can put a mix of live cell, there's a live lymphoma cell or cancer cell from the patient directly. You can look for the bead that binds to the cancer cell, in this case it's ovarian cancer cell. So we, once you know that, you take the bead cell, you remove the cell, and you sequence it. Because there are 10 to the 13 copies of the same molecule on one bead, there's enough molecule we can determine by the sequence, by microsequencing, or we can clear the compound off the bead and perform mass spectroscopy. So we know what's inside. Once we know what's inside, we can make the molecule, we can optimize it, we can attach it to a chelator, put copper 64 in there, then we can do micropet scan. You can see this is a tumor there. We can localize it using the micropet scan. So more recently, uh, we screen a focus library. This library is a cyclic <coughs> library, very short, just a disulfide bond of two D16 in there. We put D16 because it's D amino acid, therefore it's not cleavable by protease. So it's very stable inside the blood. And so this molecule, actually we screen this library, we randomize those positions, we fix some of the other ones. We find some ligand that bind very strongly to the cancer cell. These are some of them. Uh, we do flow cytometry against three different human glioblastoma cell lines. They all bind very strongly for the LX7 and LX30. They bind to the alpha-3 beta-1 integrin display on the cell surface. So using that ligands, we attach to a Alexa 488, which is a fluorescent dye. Uh, this is a section of the brain, normal brain, and also the tumor that are orthotopic implanted into the brain of the mouse. You can see that you only stain the tumor, but not the normal brain. We collect clinical specimen from the brain, uh, tumor patient, glioblastoma, is stained nicely. Human ovarian cancer also stained very strongly. So how about in vivo? So we find the ligands based on the beads. We find the beads, we sequence it, we know this is the sequence, and then we attach it, to, we biotinate it, and then mix with tripavidin sci 515 <coughs> from a tetrama. This is an e infrared dye. So in this mouse, we have implanted two tumors, one under the skin, one un inside the brain, and they have a luciferase, therefore we can use uh, perform uh, bioluminescence. You can see this is in here and also in the brain. So the same mouse, we inject this mixture into the tail vein. Six hours later, we scan it. You can see tumor uptake very nicely. The brain we cannot see because it's under the skull. So what we did is to sacrifice the animal take the organs out, this is organ bioluminescent signal, you can see there's a tumor in the brain, tumor under the skin. So this is the Li infrared, so this, we're talking about the ligand now. The ligand go to the tumor, it also go to the brain where the tumor is. Liver uptake is quite low, as you can see. So this is a conjugate with strip evidence, which is molecularly about 68,000, plus the biotinated peptides, total is less than about 70,000 molecular weight, and yet you can seek out the tumor in the brain and go to the brain. So you pass through the compromised blood-brain barrier, in this case, a glioblastoma. So how about microscopically? We can look under the microscope, take the same brain that the tumor it was uh, labeled. Uh, you can see this is a normal tumor. I mean, this, sorry, this is tumor cell. This is the normal brain. So correspondingly, we're looking for the Psi 5.5. You can see you take up into the tumor, but not the normal brain. This is the tumor under the skin, the whole thing is tumor, therefore the whole thing light up. So what we find by the beads, the ligand, actually when we inject into the animal, can go and target the tumor in the animal, as shown in here. So once we find all those ligands, we find ligands against different receptors on different cancer type, what do we do with it? Once we get the ligand, we can use it as the delivery agent against a uh, tumor. And, uh, the, the cargo could be many different things, cytotoxic drug, peptide toxin, natural product, and also some of the nuclear, uh, nuclear acids as well. We can also put radioisotope there. So uh, we have focused a lot on my cell. I'll share with you some of the data here. We also did some work on polymer drug, monomeric drug, and the first slide I show you is the chelate using a dota, the chelate copper 64, then we can do the PET scan. So this is very small. This is about 1,000 molecules away for the ligand, another you know, a few hundred molecules away here. So this is a small molecule, way up to the small molecule. This is a micelle, which measure about 25 to 50 nanometer in diameter. 
And then live Buddhism, we also did some work, but we don't do too much live Buddhism because live Buddhism is pretty big. It's about 100, 150 nanometer. I think it's a little too big for tumor delivery. Uh, of course, we can also do hard nanoparticle, uh, gold nanoparticle. We did some work on that, but again, they tend to uh, end up in the t liver quite a bit. So we like the biodegradable micelle. That's something we're working on a lot. Okay, in Brazil, we have to show soccer, right? There. And it's an article we published a few years ago. Basically, the soccer represents very well the micelle we developed. Imagine that the polymer that we make is really a pterodendron, as shown in here. I'll show you the more detailed structure. Basically, there are a cluster of cholic acid in here with a polyethylene glycol tail and some of the cross-linking moiety shown in here. And once the soccer ball is formed, these cross linker can cross-link them together to make it a very stable soccer ball. Even in the blood, it's very stable. When we want to break it open, uh, in this case, we use mannitol or acidic condition at the tumor site. You break open, the drug can come out. So this is the micelle platform that we developed. And so this is a pterodendron, a cartoon showing what it is, and then the drug in there. In, in alcohol, it's all soluble. Once it go to water or PBS, it's self-assembled to form a micelle. Inside is the drug, the outside a polyethylene glycol. And these are the cluster of cholic acid as shown in here. So cholic acid is a very interesting molecule. It is in every one of you because it's one of the bile acids that you use uh, to digest the fat. And the molecule is very interesting. It's a planar molecule with a hydro hydro hydroxyl group here. This hydro hydrophilic, whereas the other side is methyl group and also the ring structure, so it's high, highly hydrophobic. So one side is highly hydrophobic, one side is hydrophilic. So when you cluster them together, uh, shown in here, Once you put in water, all the hydrophobic side will face inside, whereas the hydroxyl group will face outside. And this all joined together, you form a, a uh, structure, uh, a micelle structure, and the polyethylene glycol will be sticking outside. Form a 21 nanometer in diameter uh, nanoparticle, which is very narrow uh, size of dispersion. We can load many drugs in there, Pacitaxel, Atoposide SN38, and many other chemotherapy uh, used nowadays, we can load them. Even plus some of the uh, long chemotherapy, which are target-specific cancer therapy. These are tyrosin kinase inhibitors, also can be loaded. So basically, many different hydrophobic molecules that is hard to formulate, we can load it in this kind of micelle in a very stable form. And then we can also, because of the configuration of the pterodendron, we can design and, uh, and synthesize. We can control the size very well. 17 nanometer, 64 nanometer, 154 nanometer. You can see that the big one is not very good because it goes to the liver. The small one goes to the tumor, where the subcutaneous tumor is ovarian cancer sinograph. The charge makes a difference too. On the surface of the micelle, when you put in a lot of lysine in here, which is highly positive charge, when you put in a lot of aspartic acid on the surface, it's highly negative charge. They all go to the liver very highly. You don't want that. What you want is something that goes to the liver very low, but the tumor very high. In this case, it's not neutral. This is actually a slightly negative charge. You get a very slightly negative charge surface, you tend to go to the tumor with little liver uptake. We can also do radio imaging. We can label this with r 125 and then do a microspec CT scan, which is shown here, this ovarian cancer implant, 24 hours after injection, still circulating, pretty much uh, the tail end of the circulation. You can still see that. But the tumor uptake is already apparent. These are implanted sinograph, uh, ovarian cancer, uh, human ovarian cancer cell implanted in the mouse. Uh, 48 hour, hours later, you can still see in the tumor retention. 72 hours, the mice are still in the tumor. But there was a washout. Therefore, you can start seeing very little in the rest of the body, but they are all in, concentrated at the tumor. So the micelle can target the tumor through EPR effect, number one. Number two is that you can stay in the tumor for days. So this make it a very effective drug delivery agent, photosensitizer delivery agents, and radioisotope delivery agent. We can also make use of the combinatorial chemistry I mentioned earlier to look for ligands that we find that bind to the cancer. And then use click chemistry, we can ligate to the pterodendron, and this one will be purified and then uh, self-assemble with the one without ligand, with ligand, the drug can be inside, and then 
this can target the tumor. We can put one ligand on or two different kinds of ligand or three different ligand as we want because it's a modular self-assembly platform. So the drug can be many, not just one. We can put multiple drugs inside. We can also put in radioisotopes there or fluorescent dye there. So it's really a multi-functional nano platform that can deliver to the cancer cell in vivo. So for example, this one showed that with a ligand. This bind our three beta-1 integrin without ligand uptake low, with ligand uptake very high. And then you can be blocked by antibodies against our three. We can use free ligand and block it. So the nanoparticle actually can target the tumor even without ligand through the EPL effect, the enhanced permeability retention effect. But the ligand allow the nanoparticle to bind to the cell surface and undergo endocytosis and bring it inside the cell. So that makes the killing effect quite a bit better. And uh, in fact, in the cell culture, you can kill a lot better with ligand than without ligand. In vivo study, it's the same thing. So we can deliver 30 milligram per kilogram of paclitaxel into the mouse without any problem. In fact, we can go to 45 milligram per kilogram without any problem. The MTD, that is maximum tolerated dose for a mouse for paclitaxel is 15 milligram per kilogram. But we can give two times, three times more without any adverse side effects. So the nanoparticle protect the animal. We can give more drug. This is without ligand. You can see the, the tumor really uh, shrink down tremendously, but you come back, some of them, without ligand. But the, li but the nanoparticle of ligand has better control. In fact, some of the mice were cured. When we go to 45 milligram per kilogram, a lot of mice were cured. So you can give a lot more drug and cure some mice. So, but the problem with the mice cell is that it is a, blood is a hostile environment for mice cell. The HDL, LDL, cholesterol in your body, especially after a Big Mac, you will be, I'm sure, a lot of cholesterol there. You can dissociate your mice cell. So what we did is to cross-link them by disulfide bond or by the boronic acid catechol bond I show in the soccer ball. So we can cross-link them and very stable, even in the blood. In fact, in SDS, the size is still there. The, two, the mice cells still form with SDS, but once you put glutathione in, you break the disulfide bond, you fall apart. So we can also control the degree of cross-linking, uh, the degree of drug release by using the amount of uh, disulfide bond. We can do the same thing for catechol boronic acid uh, cross-link. That one can be cleaved by acidic condition or by mannitol. Mannitol is a, a drug that we use in the clinic, actually, for, for brain swelling and so on. And that is, uh, 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 we can use it clinically. So this is the structure to show you, basically the same structure, pterodendroma, many cholic acid here, and we have a cysteine here. The cysteine are the ones that form the crossing, okay? And then before and after crossing, the size is about the same. It's still very narrow. We can load the drugs. And this is to show you again, similar study I showed. This is the tumor size. This is without ligand, without crosslink. And the pink curve is the one with crosslink. That means the disulfide bond, they're more stable in the blood, therefore they become better. But the, the brown line, the last one, which is even better, is we give them 24 hours after the injection, the mice cell will give them NAC, which is n acetylcysteine which is a reducing agent used in the clinic to treat kids who take Tylenol overdose. It's an antidote for Tylenol, actually. So again, we can use a drug that is already approved by FDA. We can inject 24 hours later to release the drug from the mice cell, okay? And then for those mice, actually there are eight, six out of eight mice were cured using that regimen. Again, so we give the mice cell, and then the day later we give 100 milligram per kilogram of NAC, which is a long toxic small molecule. Okay, now, so we talk about the background, now about combinatorial chemistry, about how we develop a nano platform for drug delivery. We can, de we can lower a lot of drugs. We can deliver a lot of drugs to the tumor. So this will make it more effective. Then the last couple of years, we did something a little bit different. Instead of just using all cholic acid here, we put porphyrin in there. So alternate porphyrin with cholic acid. This is the chemical structure we saw. It's using uh, <coughs> synthetic chemistry. We can make this very easily. In the lab, we can actually scale it up to multigram quantities. Uh, we make a, 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 a pterodendroma actually recently about 40 grams uh, in the laboratory and the GMP facilities uh, condition. So we can do that and scale up synthesis easy, relatively easy. So this molecule 
similar to this, can self-assemble in water to form a micelle structure shown like this. All those cholic acid porphyrin form a ring structure here. Inside is uh, just like the soccer ball shell, the skin of the soccer ball. Inside is the drug you can put in. Outside is a polyethylene glycol shell. This is about 20 nanometer in diameter. We can put drugs inside. We can also put copper 64 and get an enium there. So because there's a porphyrin here, you can chelate metal shown in here. So what it does is that you can chelate different kinds of metal. This is absorption spectrum. You can see the spectrum change a little bit. It's all range around 680 nanometer. So this is a TEM of a nanoparticle, about 20, 25 nanometer in diameter. But when you put copper in there, you can see the copper actually chelate right at the rim here, shown in here. And the outside is the polyethylene glycol. So before we see this uh, electron micrograph, we propose this structure. Once we see this, we can say what we propose is exactly what it's supposed to be. So we can chelate metal here. We can put the drug inside. We can, this is the shell of the polyethylene glycol. So this is an all-in-one formulation, many application. Number one, because of the porphyrin, you can shine light there, you can send out heat, photothermal therapy. You can do photodynamic therapy because reactive oxygen can form the porphyrin. Okay, so the near imaging, you can low drug inside, you can do MRI scan, we can do PET scan. So this is actually very interesting. This platform, uh, when it is uh, uh, my cell form, uh, it doesn't fluoresce, but when you shine light, it sends out heat. Once it dissociates them, it's highly fluorescent, but heat is low. When it's dissociated, the reactive oxygen is high. So it's architecture dependent, this property. We can load many drugs in there, including heat shock protein inhibitor. You can show that uh, Cells killing effect, light dose independent, and also when we load drug there, low dose of chemotherapy, doxorubicin, you can kill a lot more compared to just the, the platform without any doxorubicin. So very low dose doxorubicin, long toxic dose, but yet you can sensitize the photothermal photodynamic effect effectively. So this shows some of the photocytotoxic mechanism, which I don't have time to get into. Also show the mitochondrial potential changes and also show that we can put ligand in. This is a PLC4 that binds the bladder cancer. It goes to the bladder cancer cell, but not the normal urothelial cells. Take up a lot more. So again, ligand and break it inside the cell. We can show that if we infuse it by intravesical installation of lanoporphyrin in an in a, in a orthotopic uh, patient-derived bladder cancer sinograph. You can see these are the sinograph here. Actually, it binds very nicely. And, but the normal bladder really doesn't bind. This is the bladder wall. And then we can show that there are GFP cells in here, the tumor, and corresponding to lean infrared uptake. So this is intravesical infusion to the bladder cancer of the, uh, of the mouse, implanted into the mouse. You can see those are the cancer. This is normal epithelium. So again, you take up where the tumor is. So it's detection. And, and this is also show that with doxorubicin, uh, sorry, not doxorubicin, uh, yeah, doxorubicin alone, free drug, you go inside the bladder, it really doesn't do too much to the tumor, tumor still grow, this is a control. But once you put the uh, nanoparticle with the light treatment, you see the tumor is gone actually from here become here. You cannot form the tumor. You can see uh, treatment quite effectively in the mouse. This is breast cancer. To show that uptake is very nicely into the breast cancer, this is transgenic mouse. Uh, the lung also have metastasis. So we take the lung out, you can see normal lung, tumor, small tumor here, uptake is very nicely. Uh, by the lenoporphyrin. This is the tumor blood vessel. I'm uh, sorry, this is blood vessel using Dextran FITC. You can see tumor uptake. Very nice, normal brain, normal, tum, uh, normal lung. This is the normal lung here. But only the tumor uptake, even the small met micrometastasis also take up the lenoporphyrin. So you can shine light in, heat goes up. And then, in fact, those mice were cured by using uh, light as well as doxorubicin loaded the drug. You can see that this is pretty high dose of, 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 uh, of light. Therefore, whether you have doxorubicin or not, you still will cure those mice. But when you use lower dose of light, 
The one with a little bit of doxorubicin inside kills those mice, but the one without the doxorubicin really doesn't do that. So combination of chemo with photodynamic therapy is highly effective. At the same time, you don't want to keep it separate. Do it at the same time. So we can do uh, MRI scan, get the lanium label and the particle, uh, show that we can uptake the tumor very nicely. We can put copper 64 there to do PET scan, same nanoparticle. This one is interesting. We have an ovarian cancer sinograph of a tumor here. After injection of the lenoporphin, MRI scan, you can see uptake into the tumor. At 24 hours, we shine the light into this. You can see the start tumor to erode, ulcerated, and by 168 hours, the tumor is gone compared to the original tumor in here. So we can use MRI guided phototherapy, as shown in here. So last two minutes, I want to show you something. This is a common platform people use. People now, we, we think that there's a window of opportunity to look for real-time uh, phototherapy and uh, also deliver a nanoparticle. It's a rodent eye. So my colleague at Pew developed this so-called iPod, can do fundus microscope and OCT and so on. The mouse is here, pointing to the eye, you can follow one single cell over six months time. And then what we did, I talked to him, he's not a cancer doc, cancer researcher, so I talked to him, let's do some cancer work. He injects some glioblastoma cell under the, uh, behind the retina. Uh, you can see tumor formation under the retina. This is OCT. We can follow the real-time tumor growth. More importantly, we can also look at the tumor blood vessels formation, which you cannot, this is label free OCT. We can see those tumor blood vessel formation. Then we inject the mouse of this nanoparticle uh, in the tail vein, and real time, we can look at the biodistribution uptake of the nanomyce cell, uh, not, I'm sorry, not encapsulated, actually, is a nanomyce cell covalently attached to rhodamine. You can see uptake into the tumor, as shown in here. So I think this is a new, uh, a really important platform uh, because the eye is natural for the mouse, so it's a natural window. We can follow the real-time tumor formation as well as the tumor blood vessel formation and see how the tumor response occur optically. We can use also light shine to the retina or this tumor site behind the eye and then look at the real-time effect of photodynamic therapy using optical technique to see the cell microenvironment changes and so on. And I think this uh, will offer a lot of uh, opportunity to do a lot of basic science study. So to summarize, uh, in this platform, uh, we talk about CumbiCam, we find ligand, we talk about micelle, we inquire surface charge slightly negative, targeting ligand, important size matter, less than 50 nanometer. I talk about lanoporphin that we developed, I think is a highly effective uh, photosensitizer that can encapsulate drugs of your choice and then use it as a highly effective phototherapy treatment. Also can use it for MRI as well as PET scan, and lastly, the iPod, I think, is an excellent tool to study intraocular tumor. With that, I'd like to thank many, many people that make this possible. Uh, you know, we have a team of the Combi Camp and also a, a big land of therapeutic uh, team with uh, other collaborators, including the people in the vet school. We are currently testing dogs and cats now, and hopefully in humans in the next year, too. With that, I'd like to stop here, and thank you very much for your attention. Questions? We have one here, another there. Oh, it was very nice. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you. It seems that these are targeted and they hang around a long time in the tumor. Mm -hmm. It would seem this is the perfect vehicle for suicide gene therapy because you can get local production over weeks. Here you're just actually just mm -hmm. giving one drug for a certain time. Right, right. So I wonder right. if you've had any experience of doing this, and if not, right, maybe right. we should discuss this together. Yeah, well, you, I, I enjoyed your talk yesterday. Certainly I thought about it. And also, another thing is to deliver protein. But the formulation I mentioned is really good for hydrophobic drugs. So we are altering it now so we can deliver microRNA and DNA and so on. And that still needs some more work. And, but I think general idea is correct that nanoparticle can stay in the tumor site. And we are hoping to modify such a way so that the leukotide can be loaded, uh, oligoleukotide can be loaded effectively. And then protein is another interesting drug. For example, the uh, cytosine deaminase, we can potentially deliver the protein at the tumor site. Uh, that's another possibility. I think delivery, delivery, delivery 
is really the key of cancer therapy in the future. Whether it's a protein drug, small molecule drug, or nucleotide, we need to deliver to the right place. I think that's something that a lot of work is going on around the world now. Thank you. So, I, I, very beautiful work. So, the uh, uh, porphyrin that you used, mm -hmm. Uh, do you need that high a concentration for uh, amount? Five milligrams per kilogram is pretty high compared to what's being used now. Now, it may be perfectly fine in the long term, but, uh, you know, for example, the vertoporphyrin is at 0.25. Okay. Uh, and, uh, you know, photoferrin, who knows what the active component is, but that's Yeah, that's a good question. We, we certainly can, can use less. We have and to titrate and try different amounts. Uh -huh. Yeah, they, it does contribute. But you need it pretty cell. high. Uh, I know you tried it with the lower dose too. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know if you could go down low and get the. The second thing is I was surprised at your uh, mm -hmm. in vitro data where you showed that with the palkitaxel, you with the drug alone mm -hmm. in vitro you weren't it, it needed internalize it didn't internalize or it needed it. Little pack. Well, in vitro, the packetext, I mean, in vitro study using nanoparticle is not very effective. That's why, that's study. exactly what I meant. Because the drug will leak out should. anyway. Once it leak out, it go inside the tumor cell. Right, but also packetext, mm -hmm. all these small, particularly the porphyrins, they mm -hmm. work really well in vitro, better than uh, ligand bound, just because they diffuse in, so. Right, right, right. Yeah. Well, so. but actually our porphyrin is, is uh, coherently attached. It doesn't diffuse it. Well, the no, whole no, thing has to go inside. that does, but I mean right. in a comparison of the small molecule to the right, conjugated, right. Sure. you end up getting more efficacy with small molecules often, that we've played with many of them, but the targeted material gives you better selectivity. So where you say delivery, 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 right, 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 right. it's really selectivity, That's right. selectivity, selectivity. That's right. Yeah. You know, in, in vitro, small molecule goes inside the cell anyway, yeah. whether it's photo sensitizer or drugs. But, but the key thing is in vivo, can you deliver to the tumor, not the rest of the body? Yeah. Yes, sir. OK, so one more question. So uh, at one point, you showed that one of your peptide ligands bound alpha-3 integrin. So my question is, did you just kind of stumble across that? And for the other ligands, do you look for what the target is? You know, I think uh, using beat library screening, we can screen for specific target by using a specific uh, molecule display on the cell and then subtraction, we can look for that. But another way is randomly screening. Anything that binds in the cell counts. So in fact, several of them do bind the integrin, but we have something we don't know what they bind to. So you, you look for whoever binds the cell, basically. But if you don't know what it binds to, are you interested to find out? Uh, I am interested in finding out, but there are, sometimes there are too many of them. I don't have enough resources to find out exactly which one they bind to. But specificity is another important issue, too, not just binding. Because all positive charge peptides do bind the cell. But you want something more specific rather than just long specific charge interaction. OK, thank you. Okay, so let's thank you again, uh, Professor Lamb, for the nice talk. Thank you. Thank you.